During many processes, variables that relate to a material's physical and chemical composition are measured. These variables, called analytical variables, are typically measured with instruments called analyzers. The information provided by analytical measurements is used to make sure that process requirements are met. Sometimes it's necessary to determine the relative amounts of substances in solutions or mixtures. One way to do this is through density and specific gravity measurements. Density is the weight per unit volume of a substance. It's commonly expressed in units such as pounds per cubic foot or grams per cubic centimeter. For example, the density of water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot or one gram per cubic centimeter. The densities of different substances can be compared in terms of their specific gravities. Specific gravity is the ratio of the weight of a fixed volume of a substance to the weight of an equal volume of water at a standard temperature of four degrees Celsius, the temperature at which water is most dense. For example, the specific gravity of this alcohol can be determined by dividing its density, 0.79 grams per cubic centimeter, by the density of an equal volume of water, one gram per cubic centimeter. When the division is done, the units of measurement cancel out, leaving a specific gravity value of 0.79. This means that alcohol is 0.79 times as dense as water. Now, the density and the specific gravity of a solution can vary according to the relative amounts of substances in the solution. For example, if you mix alcohol and water, the specific gravity of the solution will depend on how much of each liquid is used. Since alcohol has a lower specific gravity than water, the more alcohol it's used, the lower the specific gravity of the solution. Density measurements are often used to determine the purity or concentration of salt solutions, petroleum products, and acids. One way to take these measurements is to use a hydrometer. Hydrometers vary in design, but this one is basically a sealed glass tube with a weight at one end and a specific gravity scale enclosed in a stem on the other end. A hydrometer works on the principle that a floating object displaces an amount of liquid that's equal to its own weight. Based on this principle, the depth at which a hydrometer floats in a liquid is an indication of the liquid's specific gravity. For example, this hydrometer floats in a container of acid. This acid is relatively dense, so the hydrometer displaces only a small amount of the liquid and floats near the surface. The hydrometer's scale indicates a specific gravity value of about 1.6. Now, if the acid is replaced with a less dense solution, the hydrometer displaces more of the solution and sinks lower. As a result, the hydrometer scale indicates a lower specific gravity value. The density of a liquid can be affected by different factors, one of which is temperature. For that reason, many hydrometers are calibrated for a standard temperature of 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, some hydrometers are used with a thermometer so that temperature compensations can be made. For example, this thermometer has a scale that lists correction factors for temperature compensation. To obtain a specific gravity reading, the temperature is first read on the right-hand scale, and then the equivalent correction factor is taken from the left-hand scale. For temperatures above 77 degrees, the correction factor is added to the hydrometer reading. For temperatures below 77 degrees, the correction factor is subtracted. With some methods of density measurement, the entire measuring procedure must be repeated every time a reading is needed for a new sample of solution. But some systems, like this density bubbler system, allow for continuous density measurements. The operation of this density bubbler system is based on the fact that the difference in pressure across a differential pressure, or DP cell, depends not only on the difference in the length of two bubbler tubes, but also on the density of the liquid in the tank. During operation, regulators are used to adjust air flows through the two bubbler tubes until bubbles slowly rise from each tube. The air pressure needed to clear each tube of liquid is equal to the pressure exerted by the liquid above the bottom of that tube. Since the tubes extend to different depths, there's always a slight difference in the air pressure supplied to the tubes. So there's always a slight difference in pressure across the DP cell. As long as the liquid is maintained at a constant level by an overflow pipe, the difference in pressure across the DP cell caused by the difference in tube length remains constant. This means that any change in differential pressure across the DP cell can be attributed to a change in the density of the liquid. An indicator that's connected to the DP cell displays the density indication. 
Often, the density indication is expressed as a percent concentration of a particular substance in the liquid. Some process liquids are too corrosive for certain density measuring devices. In these situations, a device such as this radioactive density analyzer may be used. A radioactive density analyzer measures the density of a liquid without coming into direct contact with the liquid. During operation, a radiation source sends a small amount of radiation through a pipe containing the liquid that's being measured. The amount of radiation that reaches a detector on the other side of the pipe depends on the density of the liquid. The denser the liquid, the less radiation reaches the detector. The detector may display the radiation measurement as a density value for the liquid or as a concentration value for a particular substance in the liquid. In this topic, we talked about what density is and how it differs from specific gravity. We also looked at how several density measuring devices work. Now let's try some practice questions. Density is the weight per unit volume of a substance. It's commonly expressed in units such as pounds per cubic foot or grams per cubic centimeter. A hydrometer works on the principle that a floating object displaces an amount of liquid that's equal to its own weight. A hydrometer works on the principle that a floating object displaces an amount of liquid that's equal to its own weight. The operation of this density bubbler system is based on the fact that the difference in pressure across a differential pressure, or DP cell, depends not only on the difference in the length of two bubbler tubes, but also on the density of the liquid in the tank. A radioactive density analyzer measures the density of a liquid without coming into direct contact with the liquid. During operation, a radiation source sends a small amount of radiation through a pipe containing the liquid that's being measured. The amount of radiation that reaches a detector on the other side of the pipe depends on the density of the liquid. The denser the liquid, the less radiation reaches the detector. Often, it's necessary to monitor the concentration of suspended particles in processed liquids or gases. For example, wastewater is normally checked to make sure that it's been properly treated before it's returned to the environment. One way to check the purity of a liquid or a gas is to measure its clarity. Clarity is the measure of how clear or transparent a substance is. Clarity can be measured using different types of clarity analyzers. Clarity analyzers measure light and a substance's ability to let light pass through it. Three factors that affect how light passes through a substance are color intensity, turbidity, and opacity. Color intensity is the strength of a particular color. Turbidity is the cloudiness of a mixture. And opacity is a measure of the lack of penetration of light through a substance. Turbidity and opacity are related. As the turbidity of a mixture increases, less light is able to pass through it. So as turbidity increases, opacity increases as well. Clarity analyzers measure a substance's ability to let light pass through it in different ways. For example, some analyzers provide clarity measurements based on color intensity. One such device is a colorimeter. A colorimeter measures clarity by comparing the color intensity of the solution being tested to a standard solution with a known color intensity. The standard solution is placed in the colorimeter first, and the colorimeter is adjusted to it. Then the sample solution is put in, and the color intensities of the two solutions are compared. The difference in the color intensities of the two solutions is proportional to the difference in the clarities of the two solutions. As a result, the clarity of the solution being tested can be determined. The cloudiness or turbidity of a liquid varies according to the concentration of suspended particles in the liquid. For example, this vial of liquid has few suspended particles and is relatively clear, while this one has a much higher concentration of suspended particles and is much more turbid. A clarity analyzer that measures the turbidity of a mixture is called a turbidity meter. During the operation of a turbidity meter, the liquid being tested passes through a special restriction that forms the liquid into a flat stream. A beam of light is then directed through the flat stream of liquid. Suspended particles in the liquid absorb and scatter some of the light. But the rest of the light reaches a light measuring device called a photometer. The amount of light that reaches the photometer depends on the amount of suspended particles in the liquid. The more suspended particles, the less light reaches the photometer. As a result, the light measurement from the photometer is an indication of the turbidity of the liquid. Here, the light measurement is expressed as a percentage of turbidity called formazin turbidity units, or FTUs. 
But turbidity can also be measured as a percent concentration of suspended solids. While clarity measurements are often made in liquids, they can also be made in other process materials, such as the gases from a stack. One way to determine the clarity of a gas is to measure its opacity. Opacity is basically the opposite of clarity, and it can be measured using a device called an opacity meter. During the operation of an opacity meter, a light beam is sent through the gas being measured to a reflector, which reflects the light beam to a light measuring device called a photometer. Some of the light that's sent through the gas is absorbed or scattered by suspended particles in the gas, but some of the light reaches the photometer. The photometer senses the amount of light and sends a proportional signal to an indicator, which displays the opacity of the gas as a percentage value. The more suspended particles there are in the gas, the higher the percentage of opacity. In some plants, opacity measurements are used to monitor particulates in gas being discharged to the environment. Operators often use those indications to make necessary operating changes. In this topic, we talked about what clarity is, and we looked at how three types of clarity analyzers work. Now let's try some practice questions that relate to this material. Three factors that affect how light passes through a substance are color intensity, turbidity, and opacity. Color intensity is the strength of a particular color. Turbidity is the cloudiness of a mixture. And opacity is a measure of the lack of penetration of light through a substance. Clarity analyzers measure a substance's ability to let light pass through it in different ways. For example, some analyzers provide clarity measurements based on color intensity. One such device is a colorimeter. A colorimeter measures clarity by comparing the color intensity of the solution being tested to a standard solution with a known color intensity. During the operation of a turbidity meter, the liquid being tested passes through a special restriction that forms the liquid into a flat stream. A beam of light is then directed through the flat stream of liquid. Suspended particles in the liquid absorb and scatter some of the light but the rest of the light reaches a light measuring device called a photometer. The amount of light that reaches the photometer depends on the amount of suspended particles in the liquid. One way to determine the clarity of a gas is to measure its opacity. Opacity is basically the opposite of clarity, and it can be measured using a device called an opacity meter. Water is present in many process materials, as well as in the air surrounding process equipment. Measurements of water content are often expressed as humidity or moisture. Humidity is a measure of the amount of water vapor in a given volume of air. Two basic terms used to describe humidity are absolute and relative. Absolute humidity is the actual amount of water vapor in the air. It's often measured as ounces of water per cubic foot of air. Relative humidity is basically a ratio of the actual amount of water vapor in the air at a specific temperature to the maximum amount of water vapor that the air could hold at that temperature. Relative humidity is expressed as a percent of the maximum amount of water vapor that the air could hold. Measuring and controlling humidity is important because humidity can affect moisture sensitive materials that are used in a process, as well as electronic equipment used to monitor and control the process. An analytical variable that's similar to humidity is moisture. Moisture is a measure of the amount of water absorbed by a solid material. Moisture can be measured in ounces of water per pound of material, but it's more often measured as a percent of total weight. For example, a moisture measurement of 10% means that 10% of the weight of a material is attributed to water. So if there are 100 pounds of material, there are 10 pounds of water. Many process systems are designed to use materials that have a specific moisture content. If the moisture content of a material is too high or too low, problems can occur with the process equipment or with the product being produced. Accurate moisture measurements can help prevent these problems from occurring. Different measuring devices can be used to obtain absolute and relative humidity measurements. Three devices that are commonly used are a sling psychrometer, a recording psychrometer, and a hygrometer. A sling psychrometer is typically used for spot checks of humidity in the air. This particular sling psychrometer consists of two thermometers that are mounted on a frame with a handle on one end. One thermometer is called a dry bulb, and the other one is called a wet bulb. 
The wet bulb is partially covered by a wick soaked with water. To obtain a humidity measurement, the psychrometer is slung through the air for about 20 seconds. During this time, water evaporates from the wick of the wet bulb, causing its temperature to fall below that of the dry bulb. The wet bulb's temperature drop depends on the evaporation rate of water from the wick. The more humidity there is in the air, the less evaporation there will be. The temperature readings from the wet and dry bulbs can be converted to a humidity value using a humidity chart. Spot check humidity measurements aren't always adequate. Sometimes continuous measurements are required. When this is the case, a recording psychrometer can be used. A recording psychrometer, like the one seen here, has a dry bulb and a wet bulb with a wick. The wick is partially immersed in a reservoir of water, which keeps it soaked. A forced air supply created by a small fan causes water to evaporate from the wet bulb's wick, reducing the wet bulb's temperature. A recorder maintains a permanent record of the wet and dry bulb temperature measurements. As with a sling psychrometer, the temperatures from a recording psychrometer can be converted to humidity values by using a humidity chart. Also, some recording psychrometers can process wet and dry bulb temperature information to produce a humidity value that can be read directly from the recorder. Now, another device that can be used to measure humidity is a hygrometer. A hygrometer operates on the principle that certain materials such as hair or wood expand or contract according to the amount of water vapor in the air. The hygrometer represented here consists of several strands of hair stretched between two posts. When the humidity in the air increases, the water content in the hair increases as well. This causes the strands of hair to stretch, moving a pointer up a scale that indicates relative humidity values. When the humidity decreases, the strands of hair contract and the pointer moves down the scale. During many processes, it's necessary to measure the moisture content of a solid material. Different methods can be used to do this, but one method involves the use of an instrument called an infrared moisture analyzer. Here's a simplified illustration of an infrared moisture analyzer. Simply put, the analyzer's operation is based on the fact that water will absorb certain infrared waves. During operation, the infrared waves are directed through a series of mirrors to the surface of the material being tested. Moisture in the material absorbs some of the infrared waves, but some of them are reflected up to a concave mirror. The mirror then directs the waves to a light-sensing photocell where they're measured. An indicator that's connected to the photocell displays the measurement as an indication of the moisture content of the solid material. The more moisture in the material, the fewer reflected waves, and the higher the moisture reading on the indicator. In this topic, we talked about what humidity and moisture are, and we looked at different ways to measure them. Now let's try some practice questions that relate to this material. Two basic terms used to describe humidity are absolute and relative. Absolute humidity is the actual amount of water vapor in the air. It's often measured as ounces of water per cubic foot of air. Relative humidity is basically a ratio of the actual amount of water vapor in the air at a specific temperature to the maximum amount of water vapor that the air could hold at that temperature. A hygrometer operates on the principle that certain materials such as hair or wood expand or contract according to the amount of water vapor in the air. During many processes, it's necessary to measure the moisture content of a solid material. Different methods can be used to do this, but one method involves the use of an instrument called an infrared moisture analyzer.